we just applaud the work that God is doing in our students' lives today? Amen. So this morning, we're beginning a new series called Heading Home. And it's based on the book of Hebrews. And um, uh, we're going to read uh, a couple of verses from chapter 1 and then uh, about five verses from chapter 2. And uh, just start this uh, journey together this morning. In chapter 1, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided for the purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Chapter 2. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Of all the books in the New Testament, this would be the one that it would be easy for us to assume doesn't apply, that there would be the least to get something out of it. And the reason is to who it was written to. And who it was written to are Hebrews. They're, they're Jewish people who have now accepted Jesus as Messiah. So their culture, their history, their traditions, their community are all based in something that for most of us is not known. And there's constant references throughout this book to Old Testament history, Old Testament stories, Old Testament uh, messages, Old Testament personalities. And so when we read through this, it would be easy to think, well, this, this really doesn't have that much to do uh, for us, but I would I just encourage you to think about some of the context of what they were living in. First of all, uh, a lot of these believers believed that Jesus was going to return at any moment. Like they they thought any any it could happen today. If not today, maybe tomorrow. That's how much they believed in the return of Christ. And yet, day after day after day keeps going by, and nothing is happening. And so, the longer you wait the higher your doubts begin to go. I think this book is really helpful to us because I think waiting is never easy. I think we struggle with what to do while we wait. Uh, then there were some other things that they were going through. Uh, as believers in Christ, they were, it was everything from being excluded in certain circles because their friends no longer respected them, a kind of social shunning, to actual physical abuse, a form of persecution and terrorism that was just being unleashed on people who named the name of Jesus. And so when things are going so badly, it's hard. You start wondering, is it worth it? Is this worth what I think it's worth? And uh, have I believed something that maybe wasn't right because I thought it was going to be different than this? So uncertainty is never easy. If, if you struggle with some uncertainty or wondering if you're on the right path or if you're making progress, I think this book could be very, very helpful. Another thing that happens is that when you're raised in a long-standing religious community, the tendency is to focus inward rather than outward. It's just what happens. So the questions and tensions that get raised is, how do you get closer to God without getting further from the people that God loves and wants to reach? How do you manage that tension? Or how do you make improvements in your life that you feel God is calling you to without becoming the kind of person that looks down on other people who haven't made that improvement yet? Lots of tensions. So that's why I think that regardless of the culture we live in, this book actually has a great deal to say. Now, 
We don't know who the author is. Uh, when you write a letter or an email, uh, you usually put your name at the end of the letter. In the, in the ancient world, they would often put their name at the beginning of the letter, and that person's name is not there. There's been a lot of speculation through the years. Some people believe that it was written by the Apostle Paul. Other people think not because uh, the use of language is a little bit different from his other letters. Some people think that possibly by a partner in ministry with Paul, and they have some names that... The truth is we don't know who the author is. And it's not as important to know who wrote it as what God intended to speak through it. We do know that this letter was written at least within 40 years of the resurrection of Jesus. And the reason we know that is because there are multiple references in this book, probably close to a dozen, that talk about the sacrificial system as though it were still in play. And what we do know is in 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the sacrificial system was stopped. And so uh, since there's constant reference to that being an ongoing thing, we actually believe that this was written within 40 years of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the author of the book of Hebrews, while we don't know who it is, what he's, telling, what he's trying to deal with is if, if we're on the right path and we're believing the right things, why is life so hard? Why, why are things moving so slowly? And his basic answer to this entire book is because we're not home yet. That this isn't heaven. Now, I know some of you may be surprised by that statement. You thought this was heaven. And how many were not surprised by that statement? Yeah. A few of you were. So I should have given you a spoiler alert. Uh, I mean, heaven would be great just for the things that aren't there. I have a hard time watching the news anymore just from all the things that break my heart. You just look at the faces of people who are in bearing, bearing unbelievable suffering. And I'm just so grateful that someday there's going to be a place where that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, no more separation, no more disease, no more poverty, no more abuse. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Heaven would be heaven just for what's not there, but that's not enough for God. It never is. There's all this stuff that's there, too, that it's, it's indescribable. And so what the writer of Hebrews wants us to know is we're not home yet, but we can know if we're on the right path. And we can know if we're making progress. So let's take a look uh, at this. And, and I think that there are some things that the writer wants us to know. And then I think there's something that he wants us to do. And the first thing he wants us to know is that God speaks. God has spoken to us in many times and in various ways. It, it implies a desire for God to communicate with us. He's interested in our lives and the direction that they are taking. And he's used multiple approaches and lots of different people. Now, that's encouraging to me. I'm glad that God doesn't just use one kind of personality or one kind of style or one kind of, of, of strategy, that, that God, God is multifaceted and he uses all different kinds of people in all different kinds of ways. And in the Old Testament, he spoke through prophets and through priests and through kings. And they had different temperaments, like, uh, I won't ask you to, to acknowledge this, but, but some of us are a little bit softer. Like, like if, if we were to watch a, a, a Lifetime movie, we'd probably tear up, or sometimes all it takes is a commercial, and, and we just find, why, why am I tearing up at a commercial? And, and there was a prophet like that. His name was Jeremiah. He was known as the weeping prophet. This guy couldn't talk without tears running down his face. And then there were guys like Jonah who would scare the daylights out of you. This guy had problems, and he didn't have them silently. I mean, I'll tell you how bad Jonah is. Jonah is so bad that when God actually rescued a city, as a result of his preaching, he just went up on a hill and asked God to kill him because he never liked those people anyway. <laughs> it was just unbelievable, and God used him. They had all different kinds of temperaments, all different kinds of style because God's not limited. Now, right next to God Speaks, I want you in parentheses to write two words, last days. In these last days, God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. Now, a lot of people get frustrated by this term, last days, and they go, well, how many last days are there? I mean, if that was written within 40 years of the resurrection of Jesus, that's a lot of days. 
How do we know these are actually the last days? And it's because we, we think about it differently than Jewish believers would have thought about it in the early church. So how they would think about it is, is that days are marked by who God is using or who God is speaking through. So there were the days of Moses. And there were the days of King David. And there were the days of King Solomon. And there were the days of Isaiah and the days of, of Jeremiah and the days of, of, of Daniel. And, and when their days came to an end, then it was someone else's turn to stand up and their days would begin. And what this passage is telling us, this isn't saying is telling us, try to count how many days are left. This passage is telling us that there's no other days after Jesus. His days are eternal. There's no other king, no other priest, no other prophet that's coming after Jesus. It's him. He lives eternal. How many are glad we don't have to worry that someone lesser than Jesus is going to get their turn? It's just not how it is. So, in these last days, Jesus has spoken to us. And this is what it tells us. We know that Jesus is a new beginning. Now, once again, we can miss this because we're not raised in Old Covenant theology and steeped in Old Covenant scripture. And so, right away, when, they, when, the, when the writer said, God has spoken, everybody in that group who was hearing this read out loud, they would go, oh yeah, I remember the first time God had something to say. In, in the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth, and it says, and God said, right? So we're already thinking about God speaking. And then it says this. The first thing God says is, let there be what? Light. And so this is what he tells us. This is really interesting. He says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. He focuses on the light. God is speaking through his son. And it's about the, what he's saying is, God is creating something new. If, if you were a Hebrew listening to this, you go, God is speaking, and there's light. This is something new. God, God is creating something new. There was another time that, that light was really important in the nation of Israel, and that was after they had been enslaved by the, the uh, nation of Egypt for over 400 years. God, in the days of Moses, brought them out of Egypt, and he led them through the wilderness by a pillar of fire. So light to them means God is doing a new thing, and he's bringing new levels of freedom to our lives. That there are things that may have been holding us back or keeping us from becoming all that God intended, and God is doing something by speaking through his Son, who is the radiance of his glory, that, that this is a brand new beginning, and we're experiencing new freedoms. And then he says this, that Jesus is the exact representation of God. He is the exact representation of God. doesn't just bear a resemblance. You know, uh, some people will, will go up to one of our kids and they'll say, oh, you look like your dad. And I always say, I'm sorry about that. You know. They bear a resemblance, but that's not the same thing as an exact representation. What is this passage saying? What this passage is telling us is whatever idea you have about God, if it doesn't fit Jesus, it's inaccurate. That there are things that we think about God, and we think Old Testament God is angry, judgmental God, and then... I don't know, he got his cup of coffee or something, and now he's a nicer God. And that's because we've misunderstood God. The Old Testament is saturated with grace that we don't see. And there's reasons for that. Because the reason we don't see it is not just the words that were spoken, but it's the tone in which they're spoken. You can take the exact same words the exact same words, and spoken with one tone, they sound like an invitation, and spoken in another tone, they sound like a threat. Now, I, I can tell you don't believe that I'm true, so I'll give you an example. Let's suppose that, that uh, your spouse is feeling amorous. You know what that means, right? <laughs> don't make me explain it, because I will. And so... 
they call your name from the bedroom, and they say your name, and they say, come here right now. And I mean, you are tearing your clothes off on the way to the bedroom, <laughs> right? Or exact same words, different tone. They say your name, and they say, come here right now. And you're looking for another door. <laughs> Any door will do, right? Tone can make the same words that sound like compassion also sound like judgment. All you have to do is change the tone. You can, you can be very concerned about someone, and you can say, if you keep doing that, you will be destroyed. And what they hear is, you're worried about them. Or you can say it, you keep doing that, you will be destroyed. Which sounds like judgment. And here's the thing. We have imposed tone and emotion that God never intended. If you want to know what God always intends, study Jesus. He always says the right thing in the right time, in the right way, with the right tone, with the right emotion. Jesus never says the wrong thing, and he never says the right thing at the wrong time or with the wrong tone, or with the wrong emotion. Jesus always gets it right. If you want to know about our Heavenly Father, study Jesus. This passage says he's the exact representation of God. So we can interpret a lot of Scripture based on, on tone and emotion, but if you want to get it right, study Jesus. So what are we supposed to do? And the answer is this. Avoid dangerous drifting by paying attention. Avoid dangerous drifting by paying attention. Now, there's a reason why uh, I don't usually encourage new believers to go to the book of Hebrews to start their biblical knowledge base on, on who God is because the book of Hebrews actually contains five warnings. This is the first. It's in chapter 2. Throughout this book, there are five warnings, and if you don't know the exact representation of Jesus, it will scare you to death. Like you, you will become a very insecure believer. So, what it says, avoid dangerous drifting by giving attention, by paying attention. In fact, pay the most careful attention is the word that's used, right? Uh, how can we, what, how do we drift? And the answer is, you don't have to ever make a decision to drift. You don't have to take any action to drift. Drifting just happens. You don't have to do anything. The, the passage doesn't say pay very close attention so that you don't walk away or so that you don't defy or so that you don't disobey. It says that you don't drift. You don't have to do anything to drift. That's kind of the point. That's the risk of it all. So drifting can be caused by a lack of focus. Just the currents of what's ever happening just kind of take you along. You just get caught up in the busyness of life. Lots of people have expectations. Your, your spouse has expectations for you. Your parents have expectations for you. Your, your, your children have expectations. Your workplace has expectations. And we can get to the place where all we're really doing is just reacting to expectations rather than living intentionally. That, that's all life becomes to us. Or our mind can wander. This is what's absolutely... Uh, 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 interesting and terrifying to me, all right? Uh, they've done studies, and what they know is, is that already, let's see, I'm 18 minutes into this message. At 18 minutes, you have only paid attention to nine minutes of it. And I won't give a test to prove it because I would feel worse than you would, okay? And when a speaker drifts while he's speaking, that's really not good, okay? And whatever minutes are left, left of this, you will still only pay attention to half of it. And now you might say, oh no, because now I've decided I'm going to pay attention to every word. But you won't, because our minds wander. And sometimes they wander to something in the past, something we should have done or something we did do that we wish we hadn't done. Or, and, and we start, and we relive that, and then we regret something that we, we did or something we wish we had done. Or our minds drift to the future, and that's what worry is. Fu worry is a future orientation, and we're worried that something might happen or something might not happen. 
And so our minds just kind of wander. Our mind wanders in the past and it wanders in the future. Half the room is doing time travel at any point while we're here this morning. Like your bodies are here, but I don't know where you are. It's someplace. Uh, drifting can also be caused on focusing on lesser things. So not just by failure to focus, but on focusing on stuff that doesn't really matter. We can actually do this with Scripture. In fact, the disciples did this with Scripture, right? Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and he's meeting with them just before his ascension, and he's telling them, now, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of my Father because he is going to empower you to go and do everything that I've commanded you. And, and this is their, their response. Is this the time you're going to set up your kingdom? Is this when it's going to happen? Can we put that on the calendar? And, and Jesus just looks at them and says, the, the day is none of your business. Obedience is your business. Go do what I've asked you to do. It's amazing how many people have tried to figure out when Jesus is going to return. If Jesus wanted us to know, it would be in here. It's amazing how many people have tried to figure out who the Antichrist is going to be, which is almost always a person from the political party you don't like. <laughs> Just coincidentally. You never look at your own political party and go, oh, yeah, well, I can see where that guy, that woman, they could be the Antichrist. We never do that. If Jesus wanted us to know who the Antichrist was going to be, their name would be in Scripture. And so we start focusing on things that aren't that important. And so, and, and we, we can focus on things like pain and disappointment. You know, something doesn't work out the way we want. It's all we can think about. And, and, and we can begin to lose hope. And we can feel like our strength is starting to fail. We can start focusing on others and comparing ourselves to them. That is a, that, there's no good options with that. So they're doing better than you. So now you just feel bad about yourself. You feel insecure. This is not good. And the only thing worse than that is if you're doing better than them, and then you just feel proud and arrogant. And why, doesn't, why don't they just get their act together? Like, this doesn't work. And then we focus on differences. Difference in styles in worship and in teaching and in facilities. We get all caught up on... on and the church constantly sees these differences as disunity. If the church were unified, we'd all have the same style. Which coincidentally, when you imagine that, is the style you happen to like. <laughs> right? It isn't disunity. It's diversity. There's a difference. We don't all like the same things. I grew up in a culture where preaching was done at levels of volume that did not require a microphone, though that did not stop us from using one. <laughs> My father has a saying, any preacher that doesn't work up a sweat is all dried up. <laughs> he just thought you needed to animate it as much as possible. Either you have passion or you don't, and that's a great style, and I love being in those environments. I, I enjoyed that kind of preaching. But what I know is if I preach like that here, you would not say, Oh, Pastor Bob is passionate. You would say, who is he angry at? Holy cow, what? what's going on? And, and music from classical to contemporary and, and, and all this stuff, that building facility styles. Can you imagine if there was only one painting that was ever painted and after that everyone tried to make an exact representation of that? All we would have is one picture done multiple thousands, millions of times. There's no creativity there. There's nothing that would inspire you there. What God does is he enjoys our diversity. I think God celebrates liturgical environments and I think he he celebrates contemporary environments, and I think he celebrates when the guy is, is it needs a hanky just to keep the, the sweat off of his face, and I think he celebrates when I'm going too long. I, I think he's, yeah. oh, overtime. That's what God's saying. He's, uh, overtime. It's good. He's not done yet. It's a tie. We got to go. Because church isn't soccer. We don't believe in ties. I go until I win. That's how it works. Now you're wondering, how do you know when you're winning? Because people are responding well. 
not in silence. So, um, so God celebrates all this diversity, and here's the thing: drifting is dangerous. And it feels like you know God is saying, "You get offline, I'm going to crack you one," and that's not what it is. I can drift through a stop sign or a red light, and it could cause significant devastation and destruction to property and life, mine and others. Because the consequences for drifting are real. And God knows it. And so he says, you have to really give careful attention. So who are we supposed to pay the most attention to? He said, pay attention to what you have heard. Well, who was speaking? God was speaking. Through who? Through his son. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that the light has come. He's doing new things. He's leading us out of the things that hold us back and from becoming all that he intended us to be. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to how he says it. Pay attention to what Jesus is saying more than what you are saying to yourself. The response when we're struggling with waiting isn't to hurry. The response is to listen. God has something to say. There are some people who just think that, well, if, if God was, would show up like in the Old Testament and just make the ground shake and lightning flashing and, and people just fall down on the ground and unable to get up, I'd really believe. He did that multiple times in the Old Testament and they struggled. Why does flashing lights and shaking ground do more for you than a conversation with God in the flesh who's come to be in relationship with us? How did we ever think that an unapproachable God on a mountain was better than the one who walked into the room and sat at the table with us? So I want you to bow your heads. I'm going to repeat to you some things that Jesus said. Maybe you need to hear these today. Just maybe. Maybe this is what you need to give attention to. Jesus says, come to me, everyone who's weary and burdened. Is life wearing you down and wearing you out? Come to me. I will give you rest. Maybe you are stretched so thin and so exhausted, you can't imagine how you're going to make it another day, much less another week or a year. And you need to hear what Jesus is saying to you today. I will give you rest. Or Jesus also said this, with God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter how long it's been entrenched or how complicated the situation is. It doesn't matter if nobody else can do anything. God can do the impossible. Maybe it's time to start listening to what Jesus has to say. Or maybe you can hear Jesus say, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That if you sense a distance between you and God, it is not because he's gone anywhere. And there's no place you can go that he isn't. He's with you right now, closer than your next breath. Or maybe this phrase, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. Maybe you cannot see your way forward right now, but if you will follow him, he will lead you out of a darkness into a place where there is nothing but light. That's what Jesus is saying to you today. And these are just five things that he said. There are hundreds of things that Jesus has said, and every one of them can change our mind. He is greater than all the prophets who came before him, all the priests who served before him. He has something to say to us today. Let's stand to our feet this morning.